So, hello everybody. Um, I'm Paul Grenier with the Simone Weil Center. Um, nice to see everyone here. I think I figured out this time how to get everyone on a, on a, the screen at the same time, which, which is nice. So it actually looks and feels like a panel at the same time. So anyway, today we're gonna to talk about Russia, which is a familiar topic for the Simone Biles Center. In fact, when we first started the Simone Biles Center back in 2017, one of our inspirations was John F. Kennedy's words at his famous American University speech, where he said, if, if, maybe, even if we can't resolve our differences, uh, at least we can try to make the world safe for diversity. Um, and we, I find that whole speech really inspiring. In fact, I, it's a very humane speech, but Kennedy's intent and his project didn't work out. Um, we didn't make the world safe for diversity. What, what happened, it, it appears, is that the American sort of foreign policy establishment decided that the Soviet Union was ir irredeemably evil. Um, and, and so the Cold War proceeded, although granted with, with arms control and some, and some various restraints on it until the Soviet Union fell apart. Cold War ended. Now, once again, we're sort of faced with the same question, you know, can we, is there room in the world for a sufficient diversity for whatever Russia happens to be, whatever it, it is, or is it as some people claim using various uh, interesting syllogisms, which we can find in Marlene Laruel's book, um, that, that Russia through various logics is, is now again, irredeemably evil because fascist or because authoritarian or, 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 or for some other reason. So it's really, you know, it, it, it's, it, we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, all of you here and to have Marlene Laruel addressing a, a tr a really tough questions. Uh, maybe not such a tough question to ask, answer whether or not uh, Putin's Russia is fascist, at least from my perspective, but what it is, is a tough question. And, and I've always really admired uh, Marlene's uh, scholarship because she, she doesn't rush to make conclusions the way some people do before actually bothering to look at what is actually there. And I think that you have to understand before you make moral declarations. I, I think moral declarations are fine, but first you need to have the carefulness um, intellectually to look at the, the, everything that a country is and not just say it's just this one thing. So anyway, so Marlene, I, I'm going to introduce you first and I'll save other introductions for later and hopefully we'll have more panelists in a few minutes. But Marlene is, the, uh, is a research professor and the director of several institutes at George Washington uh, University, including uh, most recently a, a program in liberal studies, which she's the founder of. And of course, you know, one of the reasons we wanted Marlene uh, to speak with us today is because she's just authored a really important book. Uh, is Russia fascist? Unraveling propaganda, East and West. Um, just came out this year, not that uh, a couple of months ago. And Marlene, so I'm handing the floor over to you, and then and then we'll take it from there. Thank you so much, Paul, for the introduction, for the invitation. Delighted to be with all of you here today, even if virtually. I, in fact, I would like to kind of not address directly the question of the book, but arrive to it by looking, in fact, at the relationship between the regime and ideology, because I think that's one of the key elements of, of the discussion. And so I have three preliminary points to address this relationship. The first one, and that may seem obvious, but it still needs to be said, is that it depends what we mean by ideology. If we want to talk about a broad worldview, that have some principle, but that can be adapted and changing depending on the context and of interpretation, then yes, the reg Russian regime has an ideology and is promoting it to its citizen and is promoting it abroad on the international scene. But if we define ideology as something much more closer to a doctrine, kind of Marxist-Leninism doctrine, with clear identifiable texts that need to be learned and studied with authors that are really on the kind of the mandatory pantheons of, of literature and a very rigid narrative, then I don't think the regime uh, uh, has an ideology and doesn't want to have one because he wants to keep things in a fluid 
ideological environment and be able to navigate changing without being itself limited by its own ideological construction. My second point is about temporality. The relationship between the regime and ideology may change in time. It can be very dense. It can be much more kind of relaxed. I think there was a very dense interaction between regime and ideological production in the period going from the so end of 2011 with the anti-Putin uh, Balotnaya protest up to 2015, something like one year after Crimea annexation, where there was really a heavy load in, of ideological production. And since then, we have been on a kind of declining trend of, of ideological production, which is interesting because the regime is becoming more repressive towards civil societies, especially these last months. But you can be more repressive, what is creating more repressive tool without creating more ideology. And I think usually people in the West tend to link the two of them, but I don't think that's the case now. And, and the, the, the Kirienko presidential administration is staying very careful in not kind of accelerating the, the ideological production or the doctrinal production. The third point, and I already spoke about it in, in several occasions, is that there are several ideological ecosystems under the umbrella of what we call the Kremlin. And Paul had them very clearly uh, explained in his book. And so each of these groups are kind of trying to get the attention of the higher sphere of the, the collective Putin, if we may say, and try to kind of innervate this collective Putin with their own doctrinal product. I think this collective Putin and so people around Putin in their circle and the presidential administration are very careful not to try to give too much power to one center of ideological production against another, the same way they are balancing between different interest uh, uh, groups. So in that light, how should we interpret the, the uh, Putin's last comments a few days ago at the Valdai, where he was mentioning Ivanilin, Nikola Berdyaev, and implicitly he mentioned uh, uh, Gumilyov? Well, first, there is nothing new because you already mentioned D3 a lot of times. So it's still the same kind of <laughs> package that is presented when he asks, when he, he ask, uh, what is he reading, he's usually come up with the same uh, uh, list of, of uh, 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 names. It's not because Putin is saying he's reading them that they are suddenly become a mandatory readings for indoctrination top-down process all over the Russian societies. It's no more kind of Stalinist time. It's just sending signals about what is ideologically welcome and in the process in, in the corridor of this ideological ecosystem. Well, the reference to Gumilyov is a very classic one. Putin has been mentioning him since the early 2000s. It's a classic, it's almost a by default <laughs> comment coming from the, the, the higher circle because it's a commitment to multinationality and multi-religiosity of Russia. And that's usually the way any reference to Gumilyov is understood. Very people know in depth what Gumilyov was saying about Eurasia or about ethnic processes. It's usually a narrative used to say like, well, Eurasia exists, there is a community of destiny and Russia is a multinational purely religious country. And I don't think we need to read more than that in, in that reference to, to Gumilyov. Berdyaev has been promoted by several think tanks near the regime. He's a very classic figure of Russian philosophical thought and a symbol of uh, the cultural production of uh, uh, the, the Russian immigration during the interwar. And here what I see in the reference to Berdyaev, it's of course classic reference to Russian philosophy, to the, the idea of Russian idea, but also to a reference to the immigration as a way for Russia to reconnect with Europe. And I think it's really important for this collective Putin to continue to say Russia is part of Europe culturally, and therefore the big names of the immigration who are living in Europe are kind of integral legacy of this Europeanness. Of, of Russia. Ilin is a slightly more problematic personality to being brought in that level of the, the collective Putin because it's a figure of the immigration, but of a much more politicized uh, side of the immigration compared to Berdyaev, really related to the white immigration, the white past with ambiguous relation to uh, fascist ideology in general, some ambiguous relationship to uh, uh, the Nazi regime in the early 30s. But what Ilins means in this kind of collective Putin's narrative 
is that Russia is a strong state, needs a strong leader, and needs to be assertive on the international scene. I think Ilin is more problematic because when you read Ilin, there are many, many things that don't match with the regime's broad ideological uh, uh, worldview today, especially a very strong anti-Sovietism that doesn't match what is the reality of the Russian elites uh, 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 today. So I think this, the fact that Ilin has been regularly mentioned, but not more often than, than Gumilyov, is reflecting this uh, uh, balance between all these different ideological uh, uh, ecosystem within the, 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 the Kremlin. And what we see really becoming stronger and stronger, it's the group of people who have a very, I wouldn't say conservative, but a very reactionary approach uh, uh, to what should be Russia's ideological national idea. It's people around the Russian Orthodox Church, around uh, uh, Tikhon, uh, around Konstantin Malofeyev and Reshetnikov, uh, around Nikita Mikhailkov, who has been probably the main advocate for the rehabilitation of Ilin uh, for when, when talking uh, uh, to Putin and pushing the regime to embrace really more reactionary worldview which an impact on the Russian domestic front, mostly in terms of societal progress and, 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 and gender issues. For example, it's usually the same group uh, 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 fighting against uh, uh, abortion. It's also usually also people with a very, not only white uh, uh, narrative, but a more or less open monarchist uh, 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 um, narrative. And so I think that's interesting to see how this kind of collective Putin has to navigate the different ideological ecosystem and trying to maintain a moderate centrist conservatism, which is, I think, what the, the Kremlin, the, the presidential administration is really interested in having. But at the same time, we see that the more the, the liberals are seen as an enemy and the regime is kind of focused on personalities like Navalny, the more that opens the space for this kind of reactionary group to push for figure like, like Ilins to be uh, uh, clearly rehabilitated. So what does that tell us uh, to, to conclude and then uh, 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 open the floor to, to the other participants to, 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 to develop that, that first uh, uh, point, is that Russia still has inside what is authorized in the regime, a very diverse, plural, ideological uh, uh, competition going on, of course, liberals or political liberals, pro-Westerners liberals are excluded, economic liberals are still integrated into the system. It's really plural, it's trying to stay moderate, a kind of moderate conservatism. It's refusing doctrinal production that would be considered as dangerous for the unity of the, of the country and for the legitimacy of, of the regime. So it really doesn't fit the classic definition we have of a fascist regime. And, and in the book, I'm, I'm uh, uh, really trying to <laughs> deconstruct narratives as the one coming from Timothy Snyder or Alexander Motil about the nature of the regime as being intrinsically doctrinal and ready to fight with a very strong revengeist uh, uh, reactionary uh, uh, policy. I don't think it does. I think it's a very much more ad hoc creation of a, a, a very a uh, 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 moderate conservatism trying to find a way in, uh, in its place in the, on the international scene. And the last point I wanted to conclude on is that I think one of the good frame, an, an interesting frame to develop when thinking about Russia's and the, relation, the, the kind of ideological positioning of the country is this notion of post-liberalism. Russia has been experiencing a very radical liberalism in the 90s and has been backlashing of it for very good objective reasons. And this backlash has been coming from the Russian society before coming from the Russian state. The Russian society was more conservative in the 90s than the Putin, than the Yeltsin regime and that the Putin regime in the early 2000s. So this notion of post-liberalism in the sense of we tried it, we experienced it, we think it failed for our cultural context, and we are trying to recreate something that is not going back in the past. And that's why I think it's really important to dissociate conservatism from reactionary perspective. The goal is not to go back. The goal is to adapt and find some, time, some form of stability and predictability and defining a space where there are some progress can be made, but as a certain slower path and a certain cultural identity of Russia and the way for Russia to have a voice in the world can be preserved. 
And I really think that's the kind of, if there is an ideology uh, uh, brought by this kind of collective Putin, it's this kind of post-liberalism approach that I think is really uh, uh, give us a lot of resonance with many of the debates we're having uh, in the US or in Europe. And I will stop here and give you back the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlon. That that was uh, pity and a lot of food for thought. I, 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 what we want to do now is open the floor up for questions. To begin with, I, I think you know, focusing on your book and foc focusing on your presentation. I'll I'll start just really quickly introducing who we have here for the sake of the audience. Starting with their order on my screen. At any rate, with with Paul Robinson, who's here, professor of international affairs at the University of Ottawa. A uh, prolific author, most recently, of uh, Russian Conservatism, which I highly recommend uh, to, to everyone here. Uh, uh, Paul, that came out uh, last year, was it 2020? I, well, uh, end, of end, end of 2019. 2019, yeah. And, and of course, Paul's a very prolific writer. And you can, I urge everyone to go to his blog, uh, Irrationality, which, um, and, and then Nikolai Petro. Uh, is joining us from Moscow, where he's at a, at a conference. Thank you for being able to join us. I know it must be difficult. Uh, it's late there. Uh, uh, Nikolai Petro is professor of comparative international politics at the University of Rhode Island, uh, author of a number of, uh, of books on Russia and, and is an expert on Russian and Ukrainian uh, politics and culture and, and, and religion. And very, very glad to have you here as well. And finally, Anatoly Levin. Um, is joining us, I think, from Moscow as well. At, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And he's he's. Um, I, I just I just flew in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know you met, you mentioned that you might be you might uh, you're not you're not sure whether your flights would be on time or not. So this we're lucky to have you at all. Uh, so any, anyway, Anatol uh, Levin is a senior fellow in Russia. Uh, on Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute. Um, he's taught at Georgetown University and at King's College London, is a prolific writer on, on all of these topics on, on Russia and, and the whole surrounding area, geographic area. So fire away, guys. Um, how do you want to do this, Paul? Um, just, I think, uh, you know, whoever, I, I think we can, we can just sort of, whoever, shouts loudest you know we'll, we'll make it like one of those russian uh talk shows you know where everyone shouts at one another <laughs> oh, god forbid um shall i shall i begin yeah sure Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to congratulate Marlene on some really fascinating and, and vital work on this subject, um, and vital also because it's so often totally misrepresented in, as you mentioned, parts or most of the of the Western media. Um, coming from listening to Putin's speech at the Valdai, uh, a uh, considerable chunk of which was devoted to um, an attack on woke culture, or I don't know, excessive, or 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 um, ultra, or, or latest, or fashionable, or some kind of liberalism. Anyway, um, I, I did think um, at certain moments uh, of writing a, an article um, entitled "Putin Seeks Republican Nomination in 2024," and I, I just want to to ask you, Marlene, because. Um, uh, this sort of, well, really, I mean, a, a media flippity gibbet, Konstantin Bogomolov also made a, gave, gave a talk to the Valdai. And um, I, I thought that the, the differences seemed to me quite um, interesting. Uh, both of those remarks were highly eclectic. As you said, I mean, you know, Putin is, is you know, does absolutely not have a, a sort of closed doctrine. But it struck me that um, aspects of Putin's remarks could still be called an attempt to define Russia as the, the Third West or Treaty Zapad. In other words, he was making an argument against ultra-liberalism, but it was in fact an argument that could have, could, could, I mean, most of it could have come, you know, just as well have been made from um, uh, reasonable conservatives in the West as well. Uh, uh, of course, he then, you know, he, he referred to Berdyaev and Ilyin um, as uh, among his um, uh, his inspirations. 
but um, I didn't find that, uh, you, you know, that, that this was in a, in a sense an attempt to distinguish Russia as a whole totally from the West. It was still within a, a, a Western context of ideas, or not Western, I mean, European, the European tradition. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing um, that uh, uh, is the people I talked to at the Valdez uh, stressed, but, but of course, as you mentioned, there are those on his staff and in his entourage who are rather, rather different, uh, was that um, Putin remains absolutely a Russian state nationalist. I mean, he is devoted to the Russian state. Um, and as he wrote in a, in a famous essay, um, this is a multi-ethnic state. He, he, he accepts, uh, the, accept, welcomes the multi-ethnic, multi-religious character of Russia. Of course, he stresses, um, you know, the need for a sort of core Russian identity, which others must, you know, respect and adapt to, to some extent. But certainly, I mean, the, the, the notion that this is in, in any sense a fascist vision is, is absolutely grotesque, frankly. Um, and uh, here, too, perhaps uh, one could see, I mean, it's certainly a distinctive vision in Western terms uh, these days, but not, not for me, I mean, uh, you know, really attempting to set Russia up as a categorical other. Uh, of the West. Um, so I wondered how, how you would see that. I mean, is is the third West idea still alive? And does Putin, in your view, still represent it to some extent? Anatole, can you clarify what the second West is? Oh, well, uh, the point being of, that there are two Wests already. There is America, which is the West, obviously, but a, a, a distinctive kind of West, uh, different from Europe, which is the second West, or I don't know, maybe Europe is the first West and America is the second West. We'll go to that. We, we, we won't discuss that. But the point being that if there are two Wests already, why shouldn't there be a third West, um, Russia, uh, but which is still a West, um, you know, not a uh, not some kind of categorically different civilization as Bagamolov in his pretty confused and 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 mushy uh, speech would have it or of course the um mm. the, the more the, the wilder shores of eurasianism but not not just them i mean a very widespread discourse in russia today uh, about uh, I, know, separate civilization I, I i think we should let marlene respond and before going on to another question since there's a lot there to chew on but just very quickly for those who are unfamiliar with the reference to bokomolov his manifesto, uh, The Rape of Europe 2.0, has been published on the simonvalcenter.org website, along with an additional article from the editors uh, giving a critique of Bogomolov's essay. Uh, so please read both, particularly if you write, write for the Daily Beast uh, or the New York Times. And um, the, the um, yeah, and the, uh, the other thing is, is just, is like, I'm just wondering, Anatole in, or, and, and, and Marlene, whether this, the, the third, the third uh, Europe idea, or, or the, or the, or Russia as the third West, I'm not sure which it is, um, is, is that, does that have a parallel with the third, Moscow as the third Rome, or is, is that was just an accidental use of the same number? No, accidental use of the same number. It's it, it's not about that at all. It's uh, it, it's it, uh, as I say, it's it's an attempt to carve out a, a a distinctive but not completely different identity for Russia, but within the context of the European tradition. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I I don't think Third Rome is really there, but I but please, Marlene, this is you know uh, asking you for, for your views. No, I, I totally agree, Anatole, and I think you may remember Lavrov's uh, uh, formula. It was in the in the two thousand about uh, there are three branches of the European civilization: U.S., Europe, and Russia. And I think it's see that it's the third West or the second Europe, <laughs> depending if you want to include uh, uh, the U.S. or not. But Russia has been used to see itself as the second Europe, the real authentic Europe. And I think now 
there is that. There is the same feeling of being the, the second Europe and a feeling of being the third West in the sense of having more connection with the US or seeing itself as part of a civilization. Indeed, so Russia is the other of Europe and the US inside one civilization, but not another from an outside uh, world. And, and, and Russia is challenging the West from inside a European framework and not from an outside framework, like I don't know, Pan-Asiatism, for, for example. I think one of the, yeah, one of the feeling in, 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 in Russia very strongly that liberalism has been, Western liberalism has been moving so far, so, so quickly, that those who are today conservative are in fact just old fashioned liberals, right? People who would have been liberals in the 50s, 60s, 70s or 70s depending. So liberals before the kind of the 60s uh, uh, moral and sexual revolution. So people for whom, and that's very classic philosophical principle for conservative philosophical point of view that individual freedom cannot be unlimited, there is a moment where they are kind of collective entity like the family or the nation that should kind of be there and limiting some of the individual freedom and the balance need to be found between this, this equilibrium. And I think that's the way uh, this collective Putin and not only it's really broader, it's really a, a feeling largely shared by the, the, the Russian elites see itself. And so the fact that Putin mentioned cancel culture very clearly in his uh, uh, Valdai speech was really interesting also at the way indeed to position itself against what they could call the new moral, new moral ethics. And that's really interesting because that's not the terminology we are using in the US to describe council culture. But in Russia, you have this formula, Novaya Etika, that is really show how much for the, the Russians are a very acute perception that you have kind of different moral worldview that are conflicting. And that's why this council culture uh, uh, is and for and thing from the Russian side, of course, they take side as they often say, they have what I call illiberal uh, 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 view, not in a pejorative sense, but in the sense that they believe in majoritarian nation centric and more or less culturally homogeneous solution for the nation state. When I say culturally homogeneous, that doesn't mean any ethnically homogeneous. The, the, the Russian diversity would be considered as culturally homogeneous. Uh, 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 so who, who see themselves as coming back with so family, nation, sovereignty on the international scene are the kind of key element. And that we identify that as conservatism today, but a few decades ago, that would have been a kind of centrist, that would have still be part of a form of liberalism, right? So I think indeed, Anatole, the, the, the third uh, West is a, is, a, is, a, is a great way to, to, to look at that. Uh -huh. Paul or uh, Nikolai, which which of you is ready? It looks like Paul. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I can follow on from that. I think um, comments first of all. I mean, Marlene, um, I like the book. I agree with pretty much everything you and um, Anatole have said. I mean, clearly there is not a there is a world view, but not a, not a dogma, and it's not a far right dogma. I think one of the interesting things came out of your book is. But if anyone has really suffered from state repression in, in, in Russia, it, it's not so much the liberals as the far right who have been stomped on pretty damn hard in, in, in the past 10, 15 years. And, and I think as you show, been pretty much wiped out, uh, which I thought was a quite, quite interesting. Um, and I think you're right, but one, one shouldn't make too much of references to Berdyaev and Ilyin and so on. I, I noticed that um, Putin said he has Ilyin's book on his shelf. But there are now 33 volumes of Ilyin. Um, so he's got one, almost certainly Nashi Zadachi, right? And, and um, Yuri Lasitso, who edited these 33 volumes, he told me they obviously haven't read the rest of them. Because, because if they had, they'd understand that what Ilyin is really about is the rule of law and stuff like this. But, but actually, you know, like Berdyaev, he, he comes from this idealist liberal tradition, although he then, you know, becomes authoritarian, but he's still in that rule of law tradition, right? Uh, and so they clearly aren't, aren't getting getting the full message. And, and um, um, so therefore, you know, pick, picking these off and saying, well, you know, he reads Ilian, he must be fascist is, is a little silly. Um, but I think it is, in a sense, if you if you take, say, Ilian and Berdyaev, what they are, as I said, is sort of lapsed liberals, right? So I think in that sense, it does fit in with what you and Anatole were saying, that 
this isn't illiberal in the sense that these sort of philosophers of what you might call liberal conservatives or conservative liberals, right? So there's no, uh, and Ilian, I mean, and that Putin in his speech, he, he quoted Berdyaev talking about the importance of the person and the centrality of the person, which is of course a classically liberal tradition. And the, the complaint, which of the Ilians and the Berdyaevs and other emigres were making, and which is fits with what is now being made is a complaint that, as you said, liberalism has ceased to be liberal, right? Um, and I noticed this in an in a article of um, Sergei Lavrov in Russia and Global Affairs a year or so ago, where he really laid into Western liberalism. But when you read it, what you see is he's complaining that the liberals aren't liberal. He's saying, you, you say you defend human rights, but you don't. You say you support democracy, but you don't. But he doesn't himself attack democracy, human rights. And so um, so um, I therefore would agree with you in that. Where I'd perhaps disagree and perhaps ask you to elaborate more would be about whether this is really connecting with the West or whether in fact there is a possibility of now something new happening in which Russia and the West actually might begin to diverge because, because you know, Russia, the West is moving on, you know, at a very rapid rate culturally in one direction. And uh, Russia is not following, or at least it's trying not to follow, whether it will succeed in not following um, remains to be seen, and I'm, I'm slightly skeptical about that, but it, it's trying not to follow, right? Uh, and therefore, there is now a possibility, which is not previously existence, of, of some serious cultural divergence. And this is, um, as I mentioned in, in a blog post today, this is accentuated by an institutional division, right? So West and East, you know, Russia and the West were never separate institutional beings. They, they were perhaps separate ideas, right? but they weren't institutionally separated. They are now institutionally separated. There is a hard institutional wall through NATO and the EU separating Russia from Europe. And of course, once you have institutional settings, then you have to create an identity to go with the institutional settings, which therefore requires accentuation of cultural differences, othering, and so on. And therefore we might possibly be in a unique historical turning point and I don't think necessarily this is true, but we might be in a unique historical turning point where these institutional divisions are going to accentuate this cultural process and, and push the two permanently apart. So, I mean, do, do, you, do you consider that to be a possibility or, or would you stick to the idea that, you know, Putin is trying to keep Russia within the European frame? Yeah, th thank you, Paul. That, that's really, really great, great point. Mm. I see two. Lim I agree with the fact that there is now like the divergence institutionally is also. I mean, the, the the sanctions and everything happening in trying to contain Russia is of course kind of creating institutions that are separating Russia uh, from the West. And I think Russia is preparing itself to this kind of isolation. There are a lot of measures that are taken by the Russian state to prepare in case Russia would be suddenly cut for a large part of Western-led uh, uh, financial or technological uh, um, uh, software institution to be able to function in a kind of autarky system. I don't know, I don't think that's what they want, but I think they are preparing for that. My impression is that there is still a strong will on the Russian side not to be cut. And I don't think that cut can entirely happen because so there is no way for Russia to go somewhere else. There is, and the, the, all the narratives about the honeymoon with China, it's a strategic alignment on some issues, but there is no will to create any kind of joint civilization or, or whatsoever. And I don't think that's seen as relevant by the majority of the, of the Russian elites. So if Russia was to be entirely cut to the West, it would have to be a kind of standalone <laughs> civilization. And that in a sense means still trying Sibirsky to go back. Type. Island Russia. Yeah, island rush. Yeah, or, but I still think it would mean trying to go back to the Western framework when it will be reopening. The second thing is that the Russian elites, and here also in a very broad sense, consider that this institutional or this kind of cultural division will not work because the West is changing also. Because in the West, there are less and less. I mean, you have the West is itself getting divided between this kind of. Uh, uh, 
ultra politically neoliberal kind of cancel culture and a more conservative West. And so that's why they are playing on this inner division because that's the way for them to hope that if the West is itself getting divided, then there will still be room to, they will still have the possibility to talk to the second half of that West who doesn't want to become a kind of a, a cancel culture uh, world. So I think they still see that there is room for, for, for not having the past entirely diverging because the West is itself changing. And I'm always impressed when we are reading uh, the, the main kind of, you know, think tanks or intellectuals in Russia, the, 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 the Big Nev, the Remizov, Mizhuyev, but also Karaganov, Lukyanov, or all, all the others, the acuity they have about the perception on the internal divide inside our Western societies and how our own model is collapsing from inside. And I think for them, it's both a fear on some level, and at the same time, it's reassuring because it means that they will be part of our society that will still be able to be in dialogue with Russia because they will be sharing some kind of values. So I think they they, they play on that. So so I wouldn't I, I wouldn't see the institutional role being entirely uh, uh, fi finalized yeah. or, or really pushing Russia away definitively. Well, I agree with uh, everything that's been said so far. In terms of the, answering the question posed, what is the Russian idea? I think Putin laid it out as clearly as it can be from his perspective, healthy conservatism and patriotism. But the thing that in addition now, and I think this is the, a debatable point, I wonder whether self-confidence in those two may be, should be added to that list. Because this seems to me, this latest speech uh, in a line of speech seems to me to be a progr programmatic statement that, um, which I've heard from other officials, uh, Russia is not going to change. Russia is not going to follow an intellectual lead, which we think is wrong and which is going uh, in the wrong direction for the West and for humanity. If necessary, Russia will be the last bastion of a, a healthy conservatism. And in order to do that, the state is very important. He said, he said in the speech and he said uh, numerous other times, the state uh, must be strong enough to support these values. And when thinking about the people that he keeps mentioning, th there is something I would like to see more of, and it's that is say there's a slew of people he could cite. And the fact that he keeps citing Berjay, Vilin, Gumilov, and not Georgi Petrovich Fedotov. Vladimir Vedle, Pavel Milukov, Dmitry Shipov, Vasily Maklakov, other uh, contemporaries of those authors that he cites, I think the dividing line comes down to the fact that Berdyaev wound up supporting the Soviet system, well, state at least, as the successor. Uh, unfortunately, you know, not ideal, but nevertheless, uh, he, he wasn't a Soviet, but he was a patriot in the sense of the country needs to be preserved against uh, Nazi invasion. And therefore, um, that had to be first. And then, you know, other issues could be, could be handled. Uh, Ilyin did not go so far because he felt the communists had gotten, had been too destructive. But again, uh, as Paul mentioned, his entire uh, focus was on the rule of law and the rule of law as an instrument of state power in support of the individual. But the, but the, the wealth of the individual, the, uh, the, the value of the individual stemmed through the law from his Christianity, from the fact that um, 
Eileen uh, felt uh, that individuals had, had God-given rights that the state and the laws were meant to defend. So uh, I would actually, uh, whereas Fyodorta, Bidle, and those others that I mentioned really were much more skeptical, especially Fyodorta, who really comes out of a, a rare tradition, I think, in history that um, was very critical of Muscovy, whereas uh, the vast majority of, of historians of Russian history uh, agree with Karamzin that um, the unification of the land, uh, of the lands was necessary and had to be done by somebody. It could have been done by Novgorod, but it wasn't, so it was done by Muscovy, and there, were, there was a price to be paid, uh, for that, and but you know we're working through that now over time, and becoming gradually um, more liberal. There's a balance to be maintained, but uh, Russia right now happens to be under siege. I think is the perception, and that's likely to continue in the future, particularly as the West goes crazy <laughs> in its own way. And uh, that's not a healthy environment for Russia to be in. So I think Russia will look, uh, the Russian idea will be to look to support conservative, healthy conservative forces, patriotic forces in other countries, countries in which, you know, they're reasonable, sensible patriots. I think uh, the thinking is that patriots all around the world should unite <laughs> and throw off their chains. But um, you know uh, that uh, that that is not actually a messianic vision. It's actually a core vision for a healthy conservatism, which can be rooted deeply throughout the world, and it doesn't necessarily. It shouldn't lead to conflict. It should lead to mutual comprehension and understanding. So I think that's the, the gist of what he's getting at when he's talking about a healthy conservatism and what the Russian idea is. Although I must say, I would like him to occasionally throw in one or two quotes from the liberal strand of Russian patriots of the silver, uh, Russian philosophers of the silver age. That would re reassure me a little bit more. I'm wondering whether just... Marlene would agree that this um, moderate conservatism, responsible conservatism, is it something, do you, do you find, or then looking at Russia as a whole, or, or its elites or intelligentsia, that, that the word confidence in that view is, is an adjective you would use? Do you feel that they are self-confident in this, or do you feel like it's, um, it, it's kind of a, anything goes, or a grab bag, or, 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 or or a lack of clarity? No, I think the more they look at the West and what they see as kind of excessive uh, uh, transformation of the West, the more they feel confident that's the way it should be and the way Russia will, will, uh, will stay. I think there is also, and, and I totally agree with, with uh, uh, Nicola, it's, it's really not a messianic strategy on the international scene. On the contrary, it's a very realist a uh, 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 base one to consider that uh, uh, you want to unite kind of conservative and kind of sovereignty uh, uh, forces uh, for a world that, that will not be uh, uh, an interventionist uh, uh, one. The, the, the problem is that when they try to speak abroad and find friends in this kind of healthy conservatism uh, uh, groups, at least in Europe, they had got mixed with really far right uh, uh, groups and that's where the, the 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 Russian strategy, depending who on the Russian side is also organizing that, has been very blurry. Like talking both to cons classic conservative and talking to far right and to several really radical far right groups whose past would have been to be on the 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 German side and not the the, the Soviet side. So that's one of the ambiguity. But that is mostly an ambiguity explainable by the fact that when Russia talk, tried to talk to European conservatives, especially after 2014, there are very few that were ready to listen. I think it's changing now. 
And so there was not really a, a, a large room of maneuver for finding partners. And that's why Russia found itself kind of discussing with far right groups. Uh, I think things are changing uh, uh, now, especially in, in, in several European countries. And also we should kind of stop being Western centric and look at what Russia, how Russia is talking to the rest of the world. And Russia is talking to the Middle East, Russia is talking to Asia and not only to China. And I think the, the, the kind of reassertion of Russia, the great power, the kind of sovereignty narrative, the kind of realism it's bringing on the international scene is in fact much well received than we want to recognize uh, uh, in the West because it's part of many political culture for kind of developing uh, 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 countries. And I was looking at the Gallup survey that just got published a few days ago about world approval of uh, leaders and, and, um, and countries and Russia is at 34% of approval. The US is below and China is below. So I think that's a good uh, 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 lesson that tell us a lot about the, the decline of uh, US approval in the world. China, okay, 30% seems a, a, a good number, but that also tell that Russia was able to kind of secure and stabilize a group of public opinion worldwide that consider that the Russian strategy on the interna international scene is, a, is a, 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 a legitimate. And to go back just on the, the, the more kind of uh, inside aspect of conservatism, yeah, I think, I mean, honestly, Putin has been repeating Ilin Berdyaev and Gumilov since the 2000, which more or less tell me that he's not really reading them or that he considered probably, or he has been told that it's, you know, the big names that he should be quoting. And I'm not sure he's doing a lot of inquiry in reading some other author. So it's more about people around him that are not really feeding him with, with other author than himself. Uh, for sure, uh, uh, looking for, for, for things to, to, to read. But I think this kind of yeah, healthy conservatism understood as an old fashioned liberalism is the dominant framework. And that has been very explicitly formulated by people like Nezhuyev or Remizov. This kind of our conservatism is your old uh, 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 liberalism. And I think that's a very strong positioning of, the, the, of, of Russia today. And that speaks to more audience, I think, that we want to to imagine or recognize in the West. Can I add, since we're all pretty much in agreement on uh, the positive message, I think there's one thing uh, worth discussing in the context of the Russian idea. How much, uh, in addition to uh, co healthy conservatism and patriotism, is imperialism part of the Russian idea? Uh, because I think uh, for statists of a certain stripe, he historically has been. Uh, the empire has many benefits uh, and was perfectly normal as a form of government uh, a century or more ago. It's only recently that the term relatively recently, that the term has, has taken on a negative uh, tone. But maybe that too is something that we should discard as a, a Western addition that we do not need. Do you think it could, that could find some traction in Russia? Yeah, I think the, the empire question, yeah, I think the empire question, go on, go on, yeah. No, yeah. I just want to add under Putin. Yeah, I think the, the empire question is an important one because the Russian society is getting largely xenophobic and that is going against the imperial tradition. And I think on that, the collective Putin has been very much standing for what they define as, as the Eurasia and a kind of imperial legacy for Russia. For example, when they say we would keep the borders open with Central Asian state or the, the South Caucasus, because that's what makes us a regional hegemon and give us our legitimacy going against their own public opinion. So I think on that, the, it's, it's an important element of the, 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 the Russian official uh, uh, vision of itself. What I find interesting when we think about empire is to compare with, with Turkey or with Central Europe. I mean, the, the, 
illiberal backlash that we are also observing in Central Europe and this kind of new conservatism emerging in Central Europe that is very much a kind of also kind of post Habsburg <laughs> uh, uh, on the kind of post Habsburg territory. I think it's important to tell us a, a lot about also kind of long durée cultural identity that I think the West didn't want it to, to see when he was hoping to engage and, and enlarge uh, uh, very rapidly. And now we see that things that were seen or thought as obvious from the West in the 90s in this kind of euphorical uh, uh, moment is uh, getting much more challenged. And so comparing the, the Hungarian, the, the Polish narrative about being the real Europe, the real conservative Europe against the degenerate, morally corrupt Western Europe, it's the same narrative as in Russia. And so I found that also fascinating to have this divide. So they may be geopolitically opposed, but they share a lot on this kind of ideological or civilizational vision of what should be the Western Europe. We have a bunch of questions in the chat and, and Q and A, and I. But we also have we have time to 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 have more questions from our panel as well. Uh, pa panelists, what would you like to do? Should we try try a couple of uh, one yes, or two questions should, from the yeah, chat? Give, we should give the Q and A people some. Why don't I get you, give you guys a rest, and I'll go. Yeah. I'll, I'll do give the Q and A people at once. And and well, and it's while we can. There's, there's so much going on here intellectually. I think it'd be good to just uh, chew on it for a second. But there, there in the um, here are sort of two oppositely oriented questions. One of them from Jeremy Glass, quite interesting. He asks. Um, you, met, Marlene, you, you mentioned post-liberalism as a potential grassroots path for Russia. Do you think Russia, do you think if Russia is able to accept plurality and the dignity of the human person as non-negotiables, there's the potential for Russia to lead the world into an area, era of post-liberalism as defined by author and University of Kent professor Adrian Pabst, um, who of course is also an advisor and friend of the uh, Simon Ball Center. That's one question. I, and before you answer that, I'm going to go to what a, a very different one from the chat. There's many questions there, and it's going to be hard to get to all of them. Um, from from uh, Katrina Vandenhoevel, um, who says she's enjoying the fascinating discussion, and, and thanks Marlene for her book. Um, she says yes, the West um, is becoming increasingly divided, and will become more so. Um, who are the main elite reactionaries? Um, she asks. You mentioned Nikita Mikhalkov. What about Prakhanov? Church elites. Where would you align new communist party on the ideological spectrum? And she asks also then about a you know a, a generational divide. Um, the, uh, I'm summarizing here to, um, to for for to save some time, but the. So I think so. Those are two different sort of opposites, in a sense, takes on on, where, on Russia. Yeah, thanks. All, all great, great question on the post liberalism. Um, well, first, I don't think that Russia's goal is to lead the war. I think they have a much more modest and realistic vision of of what they can be doing. But for sure, the plurality. I mean, the acceptance of pluralism politically or. or or otherwise is a key issue for Russia that they need to address because without that, they will not be legitimate and will continue to be put in the, the category of, of authoritarian regime. But I think they are uh, uh, able to sometimes bring together several elements that indeed would make sense for a kind of post-liberal uh, uh, order and would be able to speak to broader audience if they were able to address the, the, the question of the nature of the the, the regime and the, the lack of uh, political plurality. At the same time, this lack of political of uh, 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 political plurality is the result of liberalism in the 90s. It's maybe also the result of, of the Soviet uh, experience. But I think there is still a very strong trauma among Russian elites who are of a certain age so that they remember the collapse of the Soviet Union that plurality politically means collapse and, and a risk of civil war and, and a division of the country. And so once that kind of trauma would be passed, when that will be over, we can hope for a new generation that will not be afraid 
of uh, uh, political pluralism and will not see it as a risk of the uh, uh, collapse. But of course, that will depend on the world stage and uh, how much Russia feel, uh, feel aggressed or, or under siege by the West. And I think that's where we have this kind of dilemma of the more we are isolating Russia, the more we are in fact legitimizing a, a repressive regime as the only way to be sure the state will survive and with the state, the nation uh, uh, will survive. And so that's a kind of a, a, a vicious circle in, in, in which we are. Uh, inter intergenerational divide, yes, it's there. We see it on the survey. Um, the younger generation are in fact ideologically more polarized than older generation. You have clearly a conservative group and a more clearly identifiable liberal constituency uh, um, that is uh, uh, visible and we have it. And it's not about uh, political direction and being pro Putin or pro Navalny and so on. It's really about values. And then you can see a group of young people who are very patri patriotic, but also quite liberal in terms of gender, for example, LGBT, right? And who really don't buy all the Russian Orthodox Church uh, narrative about uh, family values. So that I think would be an interesting way to see this new generation emerging more liberal in terms of um, uh, uh, identity family issues, but still very much patriotic and still believing that Russia has a voice uh, uh, to say in the world and who don't want their, their uh, uh, country to collapse. I think it's also interesting to see that even if we have a huge brain drain and many skilled young elites are leaving, you still have people who are very clearly saying that they want to be their future in Russia. And so if the regime could kind of uh, find a way to, to, to give them the flow or more, that would kind of give us also more, more hope. On the reactionary elites, uh, yeah, I didn't mention Prokhanov uh, is influential, but, but not so much compared to other names I mentioned, who I think are more central, like uh, uh, Malofyeyev, uh, uh, Mikhailkov, uh, and, and the groups uh, around there. The church is divided. I mean, it has a majority kind of conservative pro-state uh, uh, mainstream, but it has also a fundamentalist uh, uh, branch, a mini, mini liberal uh, branch. So these kind of reactionary elites, I see them mostly now not around the military industrial sector like Prokhanov, but really around the church coming with a very reactionary narrative on uh, uh, gender issue, women rights, and with a kind of pseudo-monarchist narrative, which is of course not really about like having the Romanov back in power, but having a kind of autocratic regime where Putin will be the, 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 the Tsar. So, so these elites are there. At the same time, I don't think we should give them too much the floor and be too much obsessed with them as we were obsessed for decades with, with people like Dugin. There are many other people in the circle of the presidential administration who just don't buy this kind of narratives who are just kind of very much more pragmatic technocrats doing their job and, and trying to make the state functioning at the everyday level. And that the reality of, of the cadre, I think administration of the regime more than these kind of ideologies that are around uh, uh, in these uh, different ecosystems I was mentioning. Um, that, that's very helpful. Uh, I, I'm gonna hold off on my own reactions to this for, for, for a while so, so I can see if, if, if Paul or Anatole or Nikolai, if I, we don't, we can move beyond uh, discussing, uh, you know, Marlene's take on, on the Russian regime. And, and if, if perhaps one of you would have something you'd like to add on your sense of, you know, is, is, it, is, is, it in it, is it a proper way of formulating the question to ask whether Russia has an ideal identity? And is, 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 is it, I mean, is it just a, is it just a question, Russia is just like any other place, it, it's whatever their people choose is, is the political order they have. It, there's nothing specific to the Russian historical context. There's nothing in their, in their past that, that it necessarily determines where they go as a, as a political identity. I, I'm, I'm intrigued by, um, well, this is, going back to the book, there, there's, a, there's a passage in, in Marlene's book where she mentions that there's multiple ideologies available uh, for, for Russia self-definition um, that celebrate Russia's uniqueness in more traditional ways by emphasizing national history and culture, orthodoxy, or, and or some form of sort of nostalgia. And I, I thought that was an important passage because in contrast 
with other passages in, in Marlin's book where, where the orthodox world is sometimes I think maybe too facilely identified with the far right simply. But then is, you know, is Dostoevsky then on the far right because of his, his because for him, you know, he didn't literally say that um, without Russian orthodoxy, uh, Russia is, is, is just garbage, but he kind of implies it though, if you read, if you read what he, if you read Nipnik Pisaitinen in the diary of a, of a, of a writer uh, in, in particular. So I mean, yeah. it makes you wonder, you know, is this, is it reactionary for the Orthodox Church to be involved in, in, in Russia's identity or, or is the conservatism of the Orthodox Church and its, uh, and its sort of anthropology of the human, is that part of the Russian identity in a non-negotiable way? It seems, I think, I think we can open this up to a, broad, you know, a, a general discussion. So Paul, um, I, I don't think you can, you, there are many options open to anybody, right? But you're not actually free in which options you, you can choose because of the circumstances in which you, you, you find yourself. So the sort of path towards liberal democracy, which Eastern European states were able to take, say you're the Baltic states, is you can then associate authoritarianism and so on with Russia and occupation, right? And then, you know, liberalism becomes a, a, a liberation from occupation and is therefore compatible with a national identity formation, right? Okay. But if this is an option just not open to Russia um, as the, the occupier, as it were, right? It, 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 it can't, it, 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 it doesn't have that route available to it because of certain historical constraints. And it, it, it can't just decommunize. Like Ukraine can now attempt to decommunize because it, it's sort of making the pretense that commun communism was Russian, right? And it can pretend that communism was Russian and thereby decommunize, right? Russians can't do that. They can't get rid of the great patriotic war, right? And they, they can't get rid of the, the Orthodox church. They, 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 whatever, you know, whatever form of identity they create going forward just has in some way to meld a whole load of utterly contradictory things. You've got to have Stalin and the Orthodox church all in one, right? Perfect. However little sense it make it makes to anybody outside, right? Um, and, and you know, you get these utterly incongruous pictures of, of communist flags next to to, to, to priests and, and and so on. But I don't see how else it can be done. So the the efforts of of um, you know someone on the liberal left, you might say in Russia, to say we've got to go down the path of decommunization and and so on, or get or, or De entirely secularize ourselves, I don't think are realistic. Um, and probably this attempt which the state is doing of this fusion, which you see, for instance, in um, like the new monument to victims of the civil war in Sevastopol, where you have, you know, wedding a mother and then the white soldier and the red soldier together underneath. Um, and some poems from um, a communist and then a poem from Mr. Tuva Lieutenant Turoverov and the white army as well. You know, this is, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. Like someone like Ilian would say, how could you, how can you have a red, a white next to a red? I mean, this is like, you know, blasphemous, but that's the way it's gotta be, I think. And, and, and it, it's gonna be messy. This problem is as old as yes. You know, both sides looked, one side looked east, one side looked west, but their heart had, they, they beat as one. The Slavophiles and Westernized, he said. So uh, I'm not, these are different qualities of, um, of, of patriotism. Um, I, I'm not sure they, ideologically they're mutually exclusive, but not necessarily if one, if one uh, is trying to help the country. And I think one thing that I sense in Putin's rhetoric is, uh, and the reason I think he uh, is insistent on choosing this kind of fusion is specifically he's willing to incorporate or accept into dialogue anyone who is concerned with Russia, even if they happen to be ideologically communist 
or one thing or another that he happens to disagree with. But as long as he thinks their heart is in the right place, that suffices to accept them into the broader Russian family. Overall, if one doesn't um, you know, overemphasize politics, as we do in the West, a healthy thing for society. Well, I, I, I thought, wanted to say actually that just possibly there are some positive lessons here for America. Um, you know, that the attempt to achieve total moral clarity, which also means, of course, total moral hegemony with regard to the past, uh, is um, A, morally highly questionable, and B, of course, deeply, deeply divisive. Um, and perhaps, you know, something very incoherent, but, you know, more inclusive and tolerant uh, is, a, is a better model for all of us, um, I would say, perhaps. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing I, though I wanted to add about, um, about the Russian national ideal is, of course, that Russia is not quite unique because there's also Japan, Turkey, even China to a degree, Iran, perhaps. But, uh, uh, of course, Russia is in this position of having been a, a great empire, but also a peripheral state of Europe, uh, constantly in the position since Peter, or possibly even to a degree earlier, uh, of being the recipient of ideas um, and would-be dominant ideas coming from the West and then being adopted by sections of the Russian elites themselves. And the, you know, the, the attempt to carve out a, if you like, a dignified position of your own with regard to Western, the cultural hegemony of a, a succession, of course, of different Western ideas, but over the centuries, but always coming from outside, uh, it is, of course, a very, very common experience across the colonial and former colonial world. Um, the answers that people come up with are radically different, as in Russia, even within the new, uh, within the same country, but the the impulse to have some, you know, something of your own, which allows you, you know, not to become simply the object of, you know, ideas coming from being imposed on you from outside is, uh, I, I would say, you know, innate to very large parts of the, of the world uh, throughout modern history. If, if I can add uh, several points on the, the kind of fusion of, of the past, I think it makes totally sense. And I see it from my French kind of background. I mean, we have Louis XIV, the Re Napole Napoleon, the, revol the revolution, Napoleon and the Third Republic, and no one is seeing any contradiction in that. So why Russia would see contradiction in trying to put all that together? I think it totally makes sense. It's the, the, the récit national, as we say in French, the construction of the national master narrative should go beyond ideological division and create this kind of maybe reconstructed, but still <laughs> lived experience of, of a shared history over centuries. So for me, that is a totally logical step in the nationhood process that the regime has been, has been uh, uh, building. I think what Anatoly was mentioning, this kind of post-hegemonic, uh, 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 aspect of Russia is important and is also maybe a kind of uh, feature of this post-liberalism, this feeling that uh, uh, there is no need to force reconciliation ideologically, that you can live, because the Russian society is very divided ideologically, you really have different constituencies not agreeing on many things, and they still want indeed to live all together, and the regime want that if they are all kind of uh, uh, oriented toward at least a, a, a minimal uh, um, um, uh, patriotism. And uh, uh, Paul, just on your comment on, on the church, in fact, I was thinking, listening to you, I shouldn't have been using the church, but the Moscow Patriarchate, because yeah. the church is the body of believers and the church is, on that aspect, the church is much different. The Moscow Patriarchate, he, as an, the administration of the church is an entity in itself that has its own political games and its own financial realities and, and strategies, but the church itself is, of course, a legitimate actor in the sense of the body of believers in, in, in the society. So maybe 
I should have used the Moscow Patriarchate as a kind of institutional actor and not the church uh, uh, in itself. Yeah, I think just okay. like, I found that last part. I mean, from what from what I've read, um, the more the more reactionary elements of a church are not associated with 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 the patriarchate, generally speaking. That, that, that from what I understand, if you read doc, official documents produced by the patriarchate, they're very relatively moderate compared with, you know, what's called political uh, orthodoxy. Yeah. You know. uh, let's see. I we're 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 getting low on time. Um, there's uh, our friend Andre Sithov wanted to ask a question. I'm wondering whether it would be easiest if I just let him onto the panel so he can just ask a question real quick. Would that be okay with people? Yeah, sure. He's a Moscow journalist. Let me see if I can get, get that done. Um, here you go, Andre. Um, let's see if, he, if, it, if, this, if this works. Allowed to talk. There we go. I think I just led two Andres in by accident, but Andre Sita, if you have the floor. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for the discussion. Uh, again, uh, my question is, of course, uh, not uh, up to the level of your uh, philosophical uh, uh, <laughs> discussions uh, i'm i'm a political reporter and i will need to write about the g20 where putin uh, will be speaking my my question is about the problem of communications that we seem to be having the one of the deputy prime ministers of russia recently visited washington when he came back one of the impressions he shared was how uninformed his american colleagues seemed <laughs> My own, my my own experience recently was uh, I had a rare opportunity to ask uh, Amos Hoxton, who is uh, the uh, advisor to the State Department on energy issues. I asked him about Putin's comments, which Putin made ad nauseum in different fora over the past few weeks about how the uh, EU and the natural gas situation is is a self-inflicted wound. And he said, well, I don't know what you mean. Basically, I'm not aware of the comments. <laughs> so my question <laughs> is, it's, it's OK. It's, it's wonderful to be discussing all these philosophical underpinnings, <laughs> which are great. But uh, what's the point if people don't even listen to you, if people are not even aware? What's the point of having all the discussion? What's in Putin's head if, if Putin speaks up and nobody is aware of what he's saying? So he is speaking again in G20. Uh, in, in your opinion, what can he do differently so that at least we can begin to have a dialogue where people listen to each other? Thank you. And I'm sorry for digressing from the general direction of the talk. Thanks. Okay. Just so people know, on, on Andre, as uh has worked for many years as a correspondent for uh, for TASS uh, and lived in the United States for, I think, some 20 years until a couple of years ago. Yeah, well, if I can begin to answer, and then I guess Anatole would have also a, a lot to say on that aspect. Well, first, we are not discussing only for uh, bringing advice to politicians and, and, and uh, civil servants, but also for the kind of the, a broader audience, and hopefully they, they can hear us a little bit more. On the, the, the policy side, I think they have been now, especially, and let's talk for, for Washington DC, um, some mini groups, still a, a minority, trying to kind of reshape the way. And you see, the problem is not to reshape the way the US is looking at Russia. The problem is the, for the US to rethink about, to look at how it's looking at itself. Because the majority of the problems are, in fact, about how the US consider what is its own national strategic interest and how it should be intervening or not in the world. So on many aspects, Russia is a kind of collateral victim of this inability of the US to kind of look at itself and position itself, uh, uh, as I think it should, on, on, on the international scene. I think many people realize now that there are really lack of expertise uh, uh, in many uh, uh, federal institution, intelligence institution, uh, 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 DOD, state departments, people don't travel to Russia uh, uh, anymore. People don't speak uh, uh, Russian or very badly. People have not been trained in anything kind of Russian. Uh, 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 their, their, their level is, is very low and is therefore very much constrained by the kind of self 
the kind of media, you know, like bubble that you have in Washington DC. And that's, I think all of us have been experiencing that, but there are several small initiatives emerging. And that's interesting to see that they emerge in fact during Trump time and they are continuing. Uh, 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 now the Cato Institute has been trying to come up with you, uh, you think, and then the Quincy uh, uh, Institute. And then I would like to give the floor to Anatola kind of trying to really transform the way we are looking at Russia and trying to bring that to at the policy level. So hopefully there will be at least some voices trying to change the general uh, narrative, which is mostly indeed, as you said, about knowing nothing about Russia and not wanting to know about it. I have little to add to that. I think Marlene has put it extremely well. I mean, all, uh, all I can say is two things. Uh, one is I'm sure that every one of us has often felt this to be a terribly, terribly uphill struggle against enormous odds, uh, but it is our duty to continue, you know, to, to try to um, maintain standards of knowledge and of intellect and of, of objectivity. Uh, the um, second thing, though, is uh, that uh, we have seen on occasions in American and, of course, other history uh, that something will happen uh, historically. There will be some you know, event which will, in fact, lead to a major change of course. And unless there is some reserve of knowledge uh, about a country of you know, real information, uh, there will be nobody to take advantage of this historical conjuncture or this historical moment if it does in fact occur. So we have to try to keep this, um, whatever you want to call it, this reserve of knowledge, this redoubt alive, uh, uh, albeit against very heavy odds. I, I think, I'm afraid we, we kind no, of need to wind up. Wood? But Paul, 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 something briefly, and then I'll, and I'd like to close things out. Yeah, I mean, just my one response to Andre is, is unfortunately, a lot of this ignorance is willful, I'm afraid to say. I don't want to know. I, I mean, I can't speak so much about the United States, but uh, here, certainly here in Canada, they do not want to hear alternative points, points of view. Um, I see someone in, in the participants list who, who could actually give us some very personal experience of, of, of what happens in this country if you, if you, if you try to express an alternative point, point of view to authority. There is a, a major campaign ahead to try and shut down alternative points of view. Um, you can see a well-funded um, industry, what I call the disinformation industry, of industry of think tanks and government institutes funded to combating disinformation, who will do anything to shut down sort of forums like this, if they could. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that is a fundamental problem. It's, it's not just ignorance, there is a problem of willful ignorance. Um, and that is not, all we could do as Anatole says is keep trying, but uh, in the face of that, we're, 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 we're kind of stuck. Thanks. That was uh, a very interesting and brilliant series of responses to a very interesting, as it turned out, question from Andre Sita. Andre, thank you, thank you for that. We, you. We've already gone a little bit over our, um, our, our, our uh, alleged uh, time limit. Um, but so thank you for bearing, bearing with us, all of you. Uh, but I, I just wanted to mention before we do finally close that this, uh, this webinar or seminar, uh, seminar really uh, over the internet is part of a series that we've been holding by, uh, at the Simon Bile Center this fall on the, the problem of technocracy and civilization. And it, it may seem that this in, a, in some senses is incongruous, but to this topic or a little bit off topic, but to, to me it's not because I, I see the, this whole debate about illiberalism, uh, the divisions between, within each of our societies really in the West is part in the crisis of, of liberalism is, is, is also is part of the problem of, of the technocratic spirit in politics, replacing the form that, or, or become coming in to, to rescue this, these divisions by, by creating a world where there's uh, uh, artificial intelligence and there's uh, facial recognition software at every corner. And, and I, I see this kind of technocratic drift 
everywhere. I see it in Russia, I see it in the United States, in Australia, in Germany. Um, I think you know, the sort of the humanist, the, the more thoughtful elements within all of our societies um, really kind of need one another in order to resist uh, a kind of a post-humanist danger that I, that I think threatens, threatens the United States threatens all of us in the United States and threatens Russia. So I, the, um, we've raised some of those issues right here, even, um, and, and they were raised at the, the Valdai uh, discussions as well. So any, in any case, we're, we're gonna continue these. We'll have more seminars coming up uh, later in the fall. Um, and you can read some of the, and, and we'll post um, the recording of this session on the Simone Biles Center website, so you can easily uh, give it to all the people who couldn't be here. With that, I guess, uh, sadly, uh, I, I hate to say goodbye. This is really fun, but I, I guess we probably need to close. Congratulations to Marlene yes. for, for yeah. brilliant Thank you so work. Much. Thank you all. Great discussion. And sorry we couldn't take all the questions, but we can continue the discussion offline. <laughs> yeah. Well, so anyway, I, I will try to collect those questions and, and get them to you later. Th thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.